People often talk about the samurai or the samurai code in a completely anachronistic fashion, as though samurai culture were fixed and unchanging, as though the warriors behaved the same way in 1800 as in 1100. But of course, warrior culture changed a lot over those seven centuries. And that's one of my preoccupations as a historian, putting a sense of historical change into samurai culture, thinking about how samurai culture changed, especially as a part of broader changes in Japanese society. So today, let's look at the evolution of warrior culture in the centuries after the first shogunate was created by Minamoto no Yoritomo. Now, between 1185 and 1868, three different dynasties would use the title shogun, which we can roughly translate as generalissimo. The first shogunal dynasty was the Minamoto, with their capital in Kamakura, from 1185 to 1333. The second was the Ashikaga dynasty, with its capital in the Muromachi neighborhood of Kyoto. The textbook dates for the Muromachi are 1336 to 1573. But that's with a big caveat, because for the last 100 years, the Ashikaga shoguns were almost powerless. And then came the Tokugawa dynasty, from 1603 to 1868, with its capital in Edo, which today we call Tokyo. Now, in all three dynasties, the rulers claim descent from Minamoto no Yoritomo, even though those connections were extremely remote. But in Japanese tradition, those remote connections were important. For example, remember how in the 500s, the 25th emperor was succeeded not by his son, or his grandson, or even a nephew, but by a descendant of his great, 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 grandfather? Now you could treat a connection that remote as the creation of a new dynasty. In fact, some historians treat that moment as a break in the imperial line. But the official imperial genealogy insists that that was just one part of a direct line of descent from the sun goddess Amaterasu. So Japanese shoguns did the same thing. All shoguns in Japan are supposedly descendants of Minamoto no Yoritomo, even though some of those connections are astonishingly tenuous. The political tradition is to emphasize continuity over rupture. In Japan, even when you stage a coup, you try to find a common ancestor and you try to depict your coup as a return to origins. But even with that emphasis on continuity, when we study the transition from the first shogunate to the second, we do see change. And in particular, we see the emergence of a new samurai culture, including different approaches to morality, law, and society in general. So let's go back briefly to the Kamakura regime, the shogunate that emerged from the Ritsuryo state. The Ritsuryo system, now many warrior legal documents refer to Sho or Shoen. And you'll recall that Sho were landed estates. They were exempt from Ritsuryo taxes and inspections. But those very exemptions made them part of the Ritsuryo system. Think, for example, of a modern tax shelter, maybe in the Cayman Islands. That sort of tax shelter only makes sense if the IRS is powerful. If there's no intrusive IRS, then why would you move your money to the Cayman Islands? So in that sense, Kamakura warrior culture was still a part of the ancient imperial state. The old order influenced the structure and the behavior of the Kamakura shogunate. But that's just not true for later shoguns. They were much less interested in trying to work around the edges of the old imperial state. 
They still deferred to the emperor when needed, but they began setting up their own forms of taxation and their own forms of control. Now, the Kamakura regime, interestingly, was run largely by descendants of Minamoto no Yoritomo's wife, Hojo Masako. They were powers behind the throne, just like the Fujiwara had been behind the scenes rulers during the Heian period. In fact, it tells you how much the first shoguns were still connected to court culture. The Hojo ruled as regents to child shoguns, just like the Fujiwara had ruled over emperors. But in the late 1200s, the Hojo hit a string of serious troubles. There were internal divisions within the Hojo family, and there was incompetent leadership. But their big challenge came in the form of two attempted invasions by the Mongols, one in 1274 and one in 1281. As you probably know, at its peak, the Mongol Empire was enormous, stretching from Eastern Europe, through the Middle East, through Russia and Central Asia, to Korea and China. But the Mongols did not conquer Japan. Now, there are several explanations. The most mystical is that the kamikaze, a divine wind, destroyed the Mongol fleet. And that story was promoted by temples and shrines claiming credit for the Mongol defeat. But a more practical explanation is that while the Mongols were terrifying as warrior horsemen of the steppes, they were terrible sailors. In fact, their ships were built by Korean slave labor. Now, the Mongol invasion in 1274 was repelled by Japanese samurai with great difficulty. So in its wake, Japanese defenders built stone walls around Hakata Bay. That was where the Mongols had landed in 1274, and it's where they tried to land again in 1281. But in 1281, they were unable to land. Some of the most fearsome warriors in Asia were stuck on their ships. They did manage to regroup and land on the small island of Takashima, near the modern city of Karatsu. But before the Mongols could mount invasion of the main islands, their fleet was destroyed by a typhoon. So perhaps the typhoon was divine, but it certainly helped that the Mongols could not get off their ships. Now you might think that victory over the Mongols would have enhanced the power of the Hojo, but in fact it created a problem. You see, the fighting against the Mongols was in Kyushu, in southwestern Japan, far from the Hojo center of power in Kamakura. So the Hojo relied heavily on warriors from the southwest region, and that strengthened the bond between local commanders, who were called Shugo, and the local samurai. But even worse, the Hojo had nothing to offer as rewards. In domestic conflicts, you could offer samurai the land of defeated Japanese warriors. But the Hojo couldn't exactly offer land in Mongolia. And for most samurai, warm words of thanks from Kamakura were not the reward they had in mind. So the Hojo come out of the Mongol invasions, attempted Mongol invasions, seeming both remote and stingy. But what finished off the Hojo, the immediate cause of the fall of the Kamakura shogunate, was an ambitious emperor and a succession dispute in the 1330s. And I hope that sounds familiar because the turmoil of the 1330s does have some strong parallels to both the 1150s and the 1180s. On both occasions, two factions of the imperial line got into a fight, and the real winner was a third party. In fact, in both cases, the struggle within the imperial house left warriors more powerful and the imperial court weaker. Now, in the 1330s, the emperor was an ambitious individual named Godaigo, or Daigo II. And his goal was to restore the imperial court to its former glory, to reestablish direct imperial rule. And Godaigo insisted that the Hojo let him choose his own successor as emperor. I'm sure that sounds reasonable, 
an emperor choosing his own heir. But that was not, in fact, the custom of the day. On the contrary, there had been an ongoing power struggle between two factions in the imperial house. That struggle had started as a fight between two brothers, and it just wouldn't go away. The Hojo had been containing the problem by having the two sides take turns. Each faction got to name every other emperor. And as part of this turn-taking, Emperor Godaigo was supposed to bequeath the throne not to his own son, but to the other line. But Godaigo wouldn't do it. He was determined to put his own son on the throne. And when the Hojo insisted otherwise, Godaigo called for the overthrow of the Hojo. Now the Hojo were furious, and they sent Godaigo into internal exile. But Godaigo escaped and managed to get enough support to challenge the Hojo. Remember, the Hojo had antagonized lots of warrior families and many regional commanders. Shugo thought the, thought the Hojo were weak and stingy and remote. And with Godaigo's call to arms, these disgruntled samurai could attack the Hojo in the name of a higher purpose. What could have been called treason against the Hojo could now be described as loyalty to Emperor Godaigo. And that was a great pretext for settling old scores. So, in 1333, Godaigo's supporters crush the Hojo, and Godaigo gets to name his own heir. And everything should have gone well, but then Godaigo made the mistake of taking his own rhetoric too seriously. Godaigo seems to have envisioned a true restoration of imperial power. And to that end, he refused to appoint any of his warrior allies as shogun. He imagined that the imperial court could return to its former glory before the first shogunate. That did not endear him to his allies. In particular, the shugo, Ashikaga Takauji, Takauji made the reasonable assumption that since he had helped restore Godaigo to power, Godaigo would make him shogun, or at least give him some grand reward. But Godaigo did not. And this ended very badly for Godaigo. To make a long story short, Ashikaga Takauji turned against Godaigo. He expelled him from Kyoto, and he replaced Godaigo's heir with a prince from the rival line of the imperial house. And this new emperor, in a completely unexpected move, named Ashikagi Takauji Shogun. Utterly shocking. In exile, Godaigo's faction established their own imperial court. It was called the Southern Court. And the Southern Court held out until 1392, but without any real power. Today's Japanese emperors are descendants of what was called the Northern Court. Now, Ashikaga Takauji based his shogunate in the Muromachi district of Kyoto, and it lasted on paper until 1573. But the shogunate never lost that initial smell of treason. Every Ashikaga shogun's worst fear was that his own allies would behave like Ashikaga Takauji. And it's hard to run a dynasty where the implicit message is, please don't behave like our founder. Now, there was a brief flowering of Ashikaga power under the third shogun, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, in the late 1300s and in the early 1400s. But by and large, the 1400s were characterized by weak shoguns and a weak imperial court. And here's a good example of the limits of Ashikaga power. In 1441, the sixth Ashikaga shogun, Ashikaga Yoshinori, angered a shugo by taking some of his holdings. So the shugo invited Yoshinori to a performance of no theater and murdered him. And the Ashikaga were so weak they didn't even retaliate. So in terms of political control, this is a low point in Japanese history. The historian James Murdoch famously described the 1400s as the golden age, not merely of turncoats, but of mediocrities. 
But what's striking about the 1400s is that it was actually a golden age, not politically, but culturally. Many Japanese cultural forms that we now consider traditional are products of this era. For example, Japanese tea ceremony and Zen rock gardens, those are both largely products of the 1400s and 1500s. Haiku poetry also has its origins in this period. It emerged from renga poetry, a form of link verse that thrived in the 1400s. Moreover, the Ashikaga shoguns, especially Yoshimitsu, were great patrons of theater. In fact, no theater, now considered the most rarefied form of Japanese theater, developed during the 1400s. And here's a good example from architecture. If you stay at a ryokan, a traditional Japanese inn, that layout, especially the design of the drawing room, with a recessed alcove for a hanging scroll and a flower arrangement, that design, that's from the 1400s. We'll discuss all of these cultural elements, tea ceremony, gardens, architecture, poetry, and theater in upcoming lectures. For now, though, we just want to take note of the fact that a great cultural flourishing occurred under the Ashikaga shogunate, and that it happened at a time when Japan was, politically speaking, rather weak. Now, this might seem initially like a paradox. The Ashikaga had limited power. They didn't really control much of Japan. Their regime is characterized by treason and betrayal and murder. How could this be an era of great cultural flowering? But if you think about it, it's not strange at all. Think of Italy in the same period. The Medici's only directly controlled Florence, just a little bit of what's now Italy. And Lorenzo de' Medici, he managed to rule not through overwhelming force, but through a combination of brutality, subtle coercion, and skillful diplomacy. And all the while, he was patronizing artists like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli. So we might say that Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, the third shogun, was Japan's Lorenzo de' Medici. Savvy in backroom political intrigue, ruthless when he needed to be, and a great patron of the arts. He was also, like Lorenzo de' Medici, a tough act to follow. His successors, like poor Yoshinori, tended to get either manipulated, ignored, or assassinated. Now that's what's remarkable about Yoshimitsu. He's the ruler of a weak shogunate but he knew better than to base his authority solely on shogunal authority. He did a great job of flattering imperial courtiers and ingratiating himself with the imperial house. There's even a theory that he was planning to get control of the imperial court. Like many rulers in Japanese history, he chose to retire at the peak of his power and to rule from behind the throne. And in his retirement, he demanded many of the ceremonies usually accorded a retired emperor. We even find references to Yoshimitsu as the emperor's adoptive father, and to Yoshimitsu's wife as the emperor's surrogate mother. So Yoshimitsu was able to hold the shogunate together by playing courtier on the one hand and warrior on the other. But out in the countryside, things unfolded somewhat differently. In fact, another paradox of the 1300s and 1400s is that while practical politics were characterized by treason, that turmoil actually produced its own antidote. Because in the 1400s, we begin to see samurai defining themselves with a cult of extreme loyalty. And they began developing a new sense of samurai valor that was independent of courtier culture. One of the most famous examples of warrior loyalty comes from an epic of the 1300s. It's called the Taiheiki, and that literally means an account of great peace. And that title, by the way, is ironic because the story of the Taiheiki is anything but peaceful. It's the story of the overthrow of the Hojo and Ashikaga Takauji's rise to power. 
One of the main characters in the Taiheiki is Kusunoki Masashige. He fought for the losing side. He stuck with Emperor Godaigo and he fought against Ashikaga Takauji. Now, much of the basic chronology in the Taiheiki is accurate, but it's embellished with wonderful imagined dialogue between warriors. And although the Taiheiki was written only about 200 years after the tale of the Heike, it offers a completely different vision of warrior culture. Unlike the tale of the Heike, warriors in the Taiheiki don't defer to courtier sensibilities. Instead, they act based on what's right for warriors. And what's right for warriors above all is loyalty. Not a rarefied sense of honor or privilege, but a rough and rugged sense of duty. And here's a good example. In the tale of the Heike, when Atsumori flees, Kumagai calls him out and says, it's cowardly to turn your back on the enemy. And Atsumori comes back and then Kumagai kills him. Now in the Taiheiki, we get a completely different sense of honor. Kusunoki Masashige, the great hero of the epic, he retreats all the time. That's one of his signature strategies. He retreats if he's outnumbered. He retreats to confuse the enemy. He also retreats to lure the enemy into a trap. In fact, he retreats whenever there's a tactical advantage in retreating. In the Taiheiki, Masashige explicitly declares, if I stand and fight when I am outnumbered and then I lose and then I die, then I can't fight anymore to serve my lord. And Kusunoki Masashige rejected the idea that he was somehow supposed to indulge in a melodramatic show of honor. Instead, he focused on what for him was the real central issue, winning victories for his lord. In fact, in the Taiheiki, we get multiple instances of Masashige's deception and intrigue, but they are all legitimized by Masashige's loyalty to Emperor Godaigo. In one case, Kusunoki Masashige's fortress is surrounded by enemy soldiers. So he tricks the enemy into scaling the walls of the fortress. However, the outer walls of the fortress are fake. So then Kusunoki Masashige's men cut support ropes and the walls fall away crushing the soldiers. And then he drives back another attack with boiling water. And finally, Masashige's enemies give up on attacks and they lay siege to Kusunoki Masashige's castle, hoping to starve him out. So Masashige gathers his commanders and says, our duty is not to die here, but to survive to fight another day. So rather than fight when we are surrounded, and outnumbered, I want to fake my own death. I want to give the appearance of having committed suicide. And that way, we will get the enemy to drop their guard, and then we can escape, then we will regroup and attack again. And his men say, great idea. Forget about a suicidal last stand in the name of honor, let's get out of here, and then smash the enemy another day. Another aspect of this striking shift away from courtier sensibilities is Kusunoki Masashige's attitude towards Buddhism. Masashige's death scene in the Taiheiki is almost anti-Buddhist. Masashige and a dozen officers and their 60 retainers are surrounded by thousands of enemy soldiers. And Masashige understands that this is his last stand. He is worn out. So Masashige turns to his brother and says, Brother, they say that your thoughts at your last moment determine whether your next life is going to be good or bad. So tell me, brother, what is your wish for rebirth? Now the correct answer here is, I would like to be reborn at a higher level of enlightenment. I want to be reborn closer to Buddhahood. So therefore, I want to die with a calm mind, free from worldly desires. But Kusunoki Masashige's brother answers instead, I would like to be reborn in the human realm seven times so that I can destroy the imperial enemy. And Masashige responds, that is a truly sinful, 
evil thought, but I think exactly as you do. So let us be reborn in the same way and let us realize our wish. And then they commit ritual suicide. Now this is an explicit embrace of Buddhist sin. Masashige does not want an auspicious rebirth. He wants to be reborn to kill more. And it's a striking contrast with Kumagai's response in the tale of the Heike. Kumagai was so overcome with grief at killing Atsumori that he lamented being a warrior at all. And he became a monk. Kusunoki Masashiga serves an opposite impulse. Now this new image of the warrior does not come out of nowhere. Remember that Benke in the legends of Yoshitsune was also defined by extreme loyalty. And Masashige, like Benke, is seen as tough and rugged and burly, none of this elegant refinement of the imperial court. But Benke was the sidekick in Heike Monogatari, whereas in Taiheiki, Kusunoki Masashige is an important commander, a direct servant of the emperor. And this new sense of warrior valor had a lasting impact on broader Japanese culture. Loyalty was always an important value for warriors. But in stories like the Taiheiki, it became the most important value. And this new sense of loyalty is more abstract. Benkei was incredibly loyal to Yoshitsune, but their bond was deeply personal. It was like an intense friendship. But Masashige is not buddies with Godaigo. The emperor is too far above him. Masashige dies not for Godaigo as a person, but for his lord as an abstraction. Masashige dies for a noble cause. And so in future generations, Masashige would be celebrated as a model of loyalty for its own sake. In fact, in World War II era propaganda, when the Japanese government wanted soldiers to die for an emperor they'd never met, they invoked Kusunoki Masashige. And kamikaze pilots were exhorted to follow Masashige's example. One kamikaze group was called Seven Lives, after Masashige's desire to die seven times for his lord. But for all the power of the Kusunoki Masashige legend, it built on earlier samurai legends, rather than replacing them. And for all of Masashige's propaganda power, he still can't touch the pop icon status of Minamoto no Yoshitsune. In fact, even in cases of the Kamikaze, we find references to Yoshitsune. For example, the Kamikaze were associated with cherry blossoms. That's a symbol of death in the flower of youth. And that's an association with Yoshitsune. There's nothing flower of youth about Kusinoka Masashige. And that brings us back to our opening point. Japanese samurai culture, having evolved over centuries, is not a single codified, timeless thing. Instead, it's made up of layers of stories and legends and different examples of heroism, different views of what it is to be noble and brave. And those sometimes conflicting visions continue to shape Japanese culture.